the medical standards in, in the province of Karbala, as well as Iraq as, as a whole, is very uh, suboptimal. And uh, therefore, the, the, the vision of the founder of this hospital is to raise the standards of medical care in the in the city. There are services that are still up to date are not provided in, in, uh, in, in the city of Kerala. For example, the open heart cardiac surgery, it does not exist in the province of Kerala, despite the fact that in the province, annually more than 1,000 people die from, from stroke, from, from cardiac arrest. Basically, we thought of introducing those services in the province. What I wish really from the bottom of my heart, I wish one thing. I want to make this hospital to be a unique hospital in Iraq. So all of us will be proud of it, that we lived outside and we brought the technology, what we have, and we could build something, we could establish something for the people, for the sake of the needy, for the sake of the poor people. Karbala is not an ordinary city. Karbala is the hub of the hearts and the minds of all Muslims worldwide. Many of the physicians, doctors, uh, medical staff, they aspire, they dream of going to such a city and serving not only the citizens of that city, but millions of people who come every year to pay tribute to the shrine of Imam Hussein. So the best doctors, the best surgeons are waiting for this project to begin so they can get on board and they can go there. My name is Jafar Murtala Al Ghazwini and I am native of the holy city of Karbala, uh, which is my, my birthplace. In the early 70s, um, I, along with my parents and my family, we migrated to Kuwait and we lived there for almost 10 years. And then in the 80s, we migrated again to Iran. And in 1989, I emigrated with my parents and my family again to the United States where I received my college education. In 1996, I received my Bachelor's of Science degree <clears throat> in the field of biochemistry. And in 1997, I received my Master's degree again in the same field of biochemistry. And uh, afterward, I was uh, accepted a position at, uh, at University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, as a research associate. And by training, I am a molecular biologist and a biochemist. I worked at UCLA from 1999 until 2005. And in 2005, I accepted, I accepted a position of um, faculty member and instructor of biochemistry at United Arab Emirates University in city of Al Ain, United Arab Emirates. I worked from 2005 until 2011. In 2011, September of 2011, I came back again to my beloved city, Karbala. And since then, until right now, I am overseeing the construction and the preparation of Imam al Hujja Hospital under the guidance and patronship of, uh, of my father, Samahat Sayyid Murtad al -Qazwin. Iraqis, by default, are very conservative and they don't like to leave their country unless the circumstance mandates and force them to do so. They are unlike other Middle East Eastern nations who travel for economic uh, reasons. In, unfortunately, due to political persecution and the precarious situation in Iraq, which has started back from early 80s and ongoing until recently, uh, Iraqis had to leave their uh, country. Um, and my family was one of them. We have been persecuted uh, due to the fact that my father is a religious minister 
and due to the fact that we belong to the Shia sects and uh, during the time of Ba'ath regime the persecution of the Shia uh, sects was very rampant in the country. I don't recall vividly the, the day that we left the country because I was toddler at the time and it was early 70s. Uh, but we stayed connected with Karbala as my uh, relatives, my aunts, my uncles, my grandfathers and, and grandmothers used to live in Karbala. And the fact that we used to come once a year with my mother, of course our father stayed away from Karbala, from Iraq. And we used to, came to come once a year to visit the holy shrines of Imam Hussein and also to visit our relatives. Always my dream was that one day I also live in my, um, in my own city, in my own town. I used to go to elementary school and notice all the students talk about their own birthplace. And when you ask them where you're from, they say we belong to this neighborhood and that neighborhood. I was feeling, I was envying them that they grow up all in one neighborhood that they know the entire neighbors. Um, unfortunately, it was not in our case. So I was, I and my brothers and the rest of our relatives who lived abroad were dreaming of a day that we will come back one day to Karbala and to feel the sense of belonging toward the city. Before I was born, my father was um, um, a multiple visitor of, <clears throat> of a prison. He had been imprisoned by the Ba'ath ruling party and before them, uh, when the communists used to rule the country, he had been uh, prosecuted and imprisoned multiple times. Um, when I was very, very young, I used to remember that my uncle, Samah Sayyid Abdul Hussein al Qazwini, also was imprisoned uh, due to his religious stance. Um, when we were about to visit Iraq from Kuwait, I and my brothers and my, my mother, before that we used to be instructed not to talk about politics, not even to talk about my father's condition, where, where is his whereabout, where does he live, any contact, any of our friends. Uh, when we were asking the reason, they would tell us because of the political persecution, because, you know, the regime is nasty, they can take you away, they can get some information from you, and then you will be hurt. And that's what was going on. I even remember that my aunts, used to tell us not to talk about the situation with, with my cousins because they were relatively young. When they go back to school the next day, their, their teachers, the principal will ask them about you know, the activities that they done you know, at home, what was the discourse, what was the talk. So due to the fact that they were youngsters, they don't know, they are very innocent, they speak plainly and would jeopardize their lives and, and our lives. So I would feel the fear of the entire you know, Shia community uh, during that time, during the, you know, the 70s. And of course, we stopped coming to Iraq during the 80s and onward. Um, our last visit to Iraq was back in 1979. And <clears throat> afterward, the first visit visit that I had it was after the collapse of the regime that was in November 2003 when I came as a visitor to my holy land. Viewers from BBC World have just joined us from BBC Five Live as well, BBC News 24 and BBC One. Just take us through this final moment with the armoured vehicle clearly about to reverse in order to tighten the cable and pull the statue down off its pedestal. Today is a great day for the Iraqi people and for the coalition. Last night, at approximately 8 p.m. local, forces from the 4th Infantry Division, commanded by Major General Ray Odierno, together with Coalition Special Operations Forces, conducted Operation Red Dawn to capture the former Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. This is Saddam as he was being given his medical examination today.
I was in tears basically when I got to to the to the you know the uh, hometown uh, to that small area that surrounds the the holy shrines. Um, I could remember uh, from the 70s when we used to come the the beautiful streets, the shops, the alleyways, and of course the the beautiful shrine of Imam Hussein. Uh, this is a shrine that I could say millions of people were sacrificing their lives to get to and to see and, 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 and to pay a visit to. So it was a moment of, of, of a truth for me, a, a turning point in my life that um, here it is where I belong to and here the place that I need to serve as much as possible. So it was um, an incredible, you know, feeling that anyone who, who was fugitive for so many years and returns back to his own homeland and see his relatives would have, that was my feeling as well. At the beginning, um, my, my father who arrived uh, in Kerbala on 15th of April of 2003, just five or six days after the collapse of the regime, and he started his educational program. Um, you know the the grassroots awareness that he used to to um, you know advocate throughout his career as a religious lecturer and and religious uh, leader and minister uh, he he established that where he gives his uh, you know daily sermons of interpreting and in, in translation of the Holy Quran in the holy site of Imam Hussein and leading the prayers. دين الإسراف والبدخ والتكبر والتجبر لا لا هذا ولا ذاك طبعا في 2003 احنا كنا في أمريكا خارج العراق لما سقط صدام أنا بأسرع ما يمكن وصلت نفسي إلى كربلاء وقمت بعمل إقامة صلاة الجماعة الأوقات الخمسة في صحن الحسين الشريف وبعد كل صلاة أيضا كنت أصعد المنبر مواعظ محاضرات دينية تفسير القرآن أخبار أحاديث ثم بعدين خليت دروس دروس متعددة درس بعد درس بعد درس وشوية اشتد الحر فصار ضغط على صحتي صار عندي أزمة قلبية سخطة قلبية صار عندي سخطة قلبية نقلوني إلى المستشفى الحسيني الحكومي في كربلاء ذاك اليوم هذا المستشفى كان حقيقة بس أربعة أطباء يعني أجهزة طبية ماكو أدوية ماكو فأنا نصحوني قالوا ما طول أنت عندك وسيلة تروح إلى أمريكا روح لهناك إجرى عملية إج... رحت إلى أمريكا إجرينا عملية فتح القلب أوبن هارت وتحت العملية أنا بيني وبين الله أشي كان بالعهد أنه إذا عشت وما متت بعد العملية أرجع إلى كربلاء لأن أشوفها بحاجة ماسة ضرورية فوق ضرورية بناء مستشفى مستشفى عام ولكن بخصوص جراحة القلب أمراض القلب لأن أرى بعيني كثير منهم يموتون أو يظلون مرضى بدون علاج لذلك في سنة 2000 أواخر سنة 2007 أوائل 2008 بدأنا بذلك والحمد لله رب العالمين ومن حسن الحظ أحد المؤمنين في البحرين ما أدري من ين عرف اتصل بي تلفون قال سمعت أنك ناوي بناء مستشفى في كربلاء خاصة مستشفى الإمام الحجة عليه السلام قلت لا قال أنا عندي مليون دولار أحب أتبرع أنا تعجبت وشكرت منه قلت جزاكم الله خيرا لكنه بعدني ما مصدق أخذ مني رقم الحساب بالبنك ثم بعد يومين قال 
مليون دولار ل 800 الف يعني قطع منه 200 الف ايضا انا بعدني ما مصدق انطيته رقم الحساب سبحان الله بالبحرين ورا يوم بسرعه المبلغ وصل وهذا شجعني انه ما دام اكو متبرعين انا الحمد لله قوه ارادتي ما تراجعت قلت اتحمل الصعوبات مهما عظمت لان املي بالله سبحانه وتعالى بالدرجه الاولى والان الحمد لله طلع النتيجه البناء وفق اخر تعليمات المستشفيات العالميه في في العالم كله بدليل لابد اشرح لكم سيد جعفر شهادات اللي جايتنا من امريكا ومن اوروبا معجبين معجبين بهذا بهذا الدقه بالبناء This is the surgical theater of the hospital. We have five main surgery rooms in addition to the uh, cath lab, in addition to minor surgery room in the emergency department, in addition to the uh, IVF uh, surgical room. But these are the five main surgical rooms. As you can see, the walls of these Our rooms are made from monoblock powdered uh, stainless steel. Uh, that would ensure the easiness of the and the efficiency of the cleaning uh, and, and sterilizing the entire room. The biggest challenge that any hospital faces is the contamination, where uh, you know um, patient can get contaminated. Therefore, we make sure that in such environment we reduce the chances of contamination to basically zero. As you see, in the center of the OR, the air condition, that is called the laminar airflow. That would ensure that you will have 100% of fresh air that's pouring down on the patient and then distributed to four different quarters of the room. On each side, it will be sucked out then through filters it will be expelled from the hospital building again this is another measure for keeping the surgical um, theater and the surgeries as clean as possible now each room is equipped with which is an install fixed in the ceiling two surgical lights and two pen pendants these pendants have the medical gas outlets that come from them, plus the electricity outlets that could be used by the surgeons and anesthesiologists and the surgery team. Now, when the patient is done, uh, the surgery is done with the patient, the patient is taken from the clean corridor back to the recovery room. While the contaminated tools um, and the, you know, the equipment will exit from that door, toward the dirty corridor all the way to the CSSD department where they get sterilized again. This is the special uh, feature of our ORs um, in this hospital where each room have two doors, one as an entrance and exit for the patient and the other one as an exit for the contaminated tools. Uh, I'm Dr. Khamad Saleh Mahdi, consultant in immunology. الشهادة مالتي ام بي سي اتش بي بالبكالوريوس طب وجراحة عامة والبورد ايميولوجي اند مايكرومولوجي زميل مجلس عراقي للاختصاصات الطبية من عام 2005 لحد الان راح نباشر لان نحاول هي المختبر مال مستشفى الامام الحجة نحاول ان نكون ضمن المواصفات العالمية والاجهزة اب تو ديت وكفر افري تيست ممكن ان شاء الله طلبوا الاخصائيين اللي راح يكونوا متواجدين بحيث الله عنا مستشفى لخدمه الناس خصوصا الفقراء انا اشوف الناس اكثر هدى تتاذى اكثر هدى تعاني في ايجاد الخدمه الطبيه الصحيحه او الخدمه الطبيه الكامله وباقل تكاليف ان شاء الله. There are two reasons to open such hospital. Number one is um, there are services that are still up to date are not provided in in, uh, in in the city of Kerbala. For example, the open heart cardiac surgery, it does not exist in the province of Kerbala, despite the fact that in the province, annually more than 1,000 people 
die from from stroke from from cardiac arrest uh, which is cause number one of death in, 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 in the province and other services of course some complicated orthopedic surgeries do not uh, you know exist here so basically we thought of introducing those services in the province so for the populations for the residents and instead of traveling abroad going and spending hefty amount of money they see these services here in in their hometown next to their relatives where their relatives their family members can visit them and take care of them that was one reason the second is really to raise the quality of the medical care our vision is to serve the at-risk population with a comprehensive and compassionate care you know our emblem our motto is this ayah we have inspired our work from this holy verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Woman ahyaha nasa jamia. whoever revives a single soul as if he have revived the entire humanity that much the Almighty has put emphasis on a soul of a single living without even talking about the religious background of that soul. Uh, and fortunately, <clears throat> the medical standards in, in the province of Karbala, as well as Iraq as, as a whole, is very uh, suboptimal. And uh, therefore, we thought of or the, the, the vision of the founder of this hospital is to raise the standards of medical care in the, in the city, in this province. Therefore, our work, inshallah, will be compliant with the international standards and codes of ethic. So to give a dignified and respectable service to people who really deserve it. Um, that was our initial thought. My, my normal day starts around 6.30 in the morning. I come to the hospital, I make rounds. Um, at around 7, 7.30, we go to the operating room. I usually do at least one, maybe two heart surgical procedures in a day. Um, following that, usually make rounds again in the afternoon and see our patients, make sure everybody's doing well, and then that usually ends my day. One of the many rewarding aspects of heart surgery is that we often take patients who are becoming very disabled from heart problems, and they can be of any age. Um, and especially the younger patients, we often fix them back, heal, help them heal their heart so that they can actually go back to work and uh, continue to have a productive life, continue to support their families. The Imam Hujjah Hospital has been, has been uh, being built specifically to provide services to the citizens of Karbala. Many of these services are currently not there, especially in the realm of heart surgery and, and, heart, and, and cardiac care in general. My connection with the Al Hujjah Hospital has been as a purely humanitarian uh, mission. Um, I realized after going there and speaking with the uh, because uh, Kazwini family who is working on constructing the, constructing the hospital, there is a dire need for heart surgery and cardiac uh, um, care in general in Iraq. It is one of the most common causes of death there, and there are many, many patients of all ages um, that are being untreated. And one of the biggest impacts I feel that really has helped foster a, a humanitarian view to go and work there is that in many countries, especially developing countries such as Iraq, heart disease is often as much a disease of a younger age person as it is an older age person. The difference between there and here is that a younger age person there is often the sole provider for the family. And if something happens to that person, it has a huge impact across on the family. In the al huja Hospital in Karbala, Iraq, the Hope is that in the near future they will be able to start a cardiac surgical program. The institution in the hospital is being built with that in mind. So they're planning on having an OR very similar to this in the hospital and similar equipment as well. My name is uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali Haider. I'm an ophthalmologist, an eye physician and surgeon. 
I specialize in cornea disease, therefore cornea transplantation and surgery of the front of the eye, which is the leading cause of blindness in the world. I am a team member uh, on the group for Imam al Hujja Hospital in Karbala and uh, that is why I am here. Uh, I'm working here because I'm a surgeon, but my heart is there. Human sight in many traditions is the king of all senses. Uh, if you want to talk in technical sense, there are studies here in the United States which uh, show that after death, the thing people, humans value the most about themselves is their sight. That is why even in Persian or other traditions, say you will, uh, people will say that it is the king of all sights. It is the most valuable sense you have after your life. Imam Hussain means everything to me. Uh, I, I do not know where to start. Uh, if it wasn't for him, I would, no have, I would have no purpose in life. It is in the darkest of times in my life that it was him. It was Ashura that brought me back. It was in the best times that I would weep for him with joy too. So I don't really know how to explain it, whether it's the joy or the sadness. He is both to me in my life. So he's the perfect combination. We hold our profession very dear to us. We have, uh, uh, most of us, physicians and surgeons, we try our best day in and day out to try to help somebody. Uh, whether it is here or in Africa or in the Middle East. Uh, but do you not think it would be a dream of somebody who can give uh, or assist in, in somebody getting sight, to give them sight in a place like Karbala so that maybe that brother or sister of mine can actually see the Haram of Imam Hussain al which they haven't seen for years? So that, that is my dream. That is why we are working on this. That is why we are passionate about this, that maybe there's a blind person in the city of Karbala who after I treat him can see the Haram of either Abul Fazl or Mahmoud Hussain for the first time. That is the dream I'm working towards, even though it's going to be just in one instance or maybe one patient. But that is our dream. That is how we are connected. Under Saddam, there was nothing there, especially for the places uh, uh, where Shias used to live and especially Karbala. And now, if you go there, I went five years ago, there was so much suffering. And I would think to myself and ask my friends and uh, my companions on the trip, how come nobody is wearing glasses in Karbala? You know, that's, that's what I do, you know, uh, worry about people's sight. And they say, well, there's nobody to even check them for glasses here. So they don't get glasses. And that's like a basic necessity of a human being. Um, so, when I went to the government hospital, people have had trauma, injuries, suffering, and there's nobody to treat them. Multiple projects are uh, being developed, but none of them as organized as this. And that is why I connected to it. That is why my friends and my brothers and my family connected to this. Because it is organized, it is world class, it will serve not only Karbala, but surrounding areas. It will be based on standards, Western standards. So we not only want to give people sight or health in case of my other doctors, but we want to give them world-class health and sight. This is the inpatient award uh, for patients who will reside at the hospital after surgeries or after medical treatment. Um, basically, we have um, uh, altogether seven different awards. In each award there are ten rooms. Uh, in each room we have five rooms that are double occupancy and five rooms as uh, single occupancy. As a total the hospital holds 145 beds for the patients. This is a mother room for a double occupancy patient room that contains two patients um, in normal standard, normal situations. Um, and this is all, uh, you know, compliant with the international standards. For example, you have the bed head units that um, have the medical gases outlets, electricity outlets, lights, reading lights, healing lights. Um, and also, um, if you can see the flooring, 
it's um, you know made from fabric that is called linoleum. Um, this is special for hospitals in you know highly uh, hygiene places because it removes the joints in the in the flooring. Um, the paints that we have used in the rooms are antibacterial paints. The ceilings or the acoustic ceiling that you can see are uh, anti-humidity, antibacterial uh, ceilings. You know, Iraq belongs to the third world countries and there are tremendous challenges. I mean, from every aspect of life you will see challenges. Um, political aspect challenge, cultural aspect challenge, um, financial aspect challenge. Those are huge challenges, um, and our, you know, daily activities is always meeting these challenges on a daily basis. Um, some of them, um, unfortunately, are due to political um, situation or to the government situation. Um, yes, the government of the Ba'ath regime has been collapsed, but the system of the government, the bureaucratic system, that has been you know, established before. Uh, unfortunately, you can see it on many aspects, on many quarters of the government institutions. We have to deal with that. There are some mundane laws and regulations that belongs to the 50s and 40s probably that we have to, uh, you know, uh, grapple with them and, 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 you know, get challenged by them. Um, there are also cultural issues. I mean, the work ethic, um, getting the the right people or the right labor force to do the right thing uh, in the in the hospital was uh, was and is still a huge challenge you know hospital is a completely different building than the rest of the buildings in the world uh, it is unlike the government building unlike schools unlike universities unlike libraries unlike residential complexes it's a building that is intended for people who are sick and ill to come in and leave uh, while they're they're healthy, while you know their 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 medical uh, needs has been taken care of, so it makes it very special. Therefore, you see every year there are advances uh, and new regulations and standards in the world of medical community that you have to be you know updated with and and to keep the standards up. Here is the. Uh Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, or basically called NICU, uh, where the uh, newborn babies, if they are premature, uh, then they will be handled, you know, with care in this department, where there are incubators and they're put in incubators. Now, um, we have five stations for them. Uh, one room, which is an isolation room, basically it's airlock room if the, let's say the uh, infant is, is immune system of the infant has been, you know, deficient and not working properly uh, for the sake of, you know, uh, contamination or anything. They place it in an airlock room and then four different stations for the, for the neonatals. On the right side, uh, you will see the, uh, the center for the head nurse and the director of this area. Of course, this area will be completely restricted only the personnel, doctors, and professionals uh, will get to this area, plus the neonatals. This is scrubbing sinks where the surgery team uh, just wash and clean their hands and um, they go straight to the, to the ORs. Now this has the electronic eye that uh, they can just use to wash without touching anything. They go straight to the OR. This area is called CSSD department, which stands for Central Sterile Supply Department. Basically, in this department, all the tools, the equipment that have been used in surgery rooms are cleaned and sterilized and repackaged again and sent as a clean to the uh, ORs. In this area, and it's divided, the whole division, the whole department is divided into three areas and the first area which is basically the dirty core where all the tools um, the surgical tools are washed uh, with regular uh, you know regular sinks as well as ultrasonic sinks then they passed through the disinfectants uh, that uh, you know destroy the viruses on the walls of those tools and then they're 
repackaged in, in package form and then they are sterilized in another department and then they are kept in an ultra clean storage then they are delivered to the uh, to the OR to the operation rooms eventually we're all human beings are relatives to each other if one of us suffer the rest also eventually will suffer uh, Iraq is an important country in the Middle East if it stays backward, if it stays lack of any services, um, other countries will be affected as well. This is number one. Second is uh, due to the uh, special status of Karbala. Karbala is fortunate to, to contain the, the bodies of, uh, of holy Imam, Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, who has been sought uh, by millions of peoples who, who come on an annual basis to visit the place. So when you have uh, a sizable city like Karbala with 1.2 million populations, in addition to millions of pilgrims who pay homage to the, to the site of Imam Hussein, to the shrines of Imam Hussein, it mandates that the services, the infrastructure of the, of the city should be up to, to certain standards. Um, Sacrificing in this cause is very rewarding. Definitely in this life and in the hereafter. Uh, we came with this mentality, with this kind of sentiment. First of all, I feel very blessed that I'm in a profession where healing is part of this profession. You know, we, physicians are healers. And I really believe that this profession is an amazing profession where I can bring my faith and my profession together. Um, and I truly believe that healing comes from God himself. And we, when we sincerely uh, try to help people, we become actually his tools. And that is the most blessed thing, uh, blessed thing about this profession. So that's why medicine is called a science, but is also an art. And that is the art of healing, which comes from what you feel when you touch the patient, how you interact with the patient. And that is why the patient-doctor relationship is an integral part of what we do every day. Um, and I really think that this is what I enjoy doing. When I go to the patients and I hold their hand and I comfort them and uh, talk to them about the disease and use my own experience uh, to, to basically bring healing to them. I've been going to Karbala for the last seven years, almost, at least once a year. And about three years ago, some of our friends, physicians, contacted us to see if we were willing to get involved in this project, which is the Imam al hujja Hospital project started by Sayyid Mutaza Kazwini, uh, who is a religious scholar and leader in Karbala. And this was his vision to start a hospital which can provide uh, a standard health care for the people who live in Karbala and also tens of millions of people who visit Karbala every year. So myself and another group of another about 10 physicians, we got involved. Uh, most of us are practicing in different fields of medicine in North America, Canada and US. And our role is to basically help the hospital come to uh, a, intern a standard where we can say that we are providing uh, healthcare which meets the international standards. Few million people live in Karbala and there are another 20-30 million people who visit Karbala every year and at this point they do not. There is a small hospital there uh, which is very rudimentary and does not have all the, um, uh, the, the health care which, which can meet the international standards. It's, it's a very substandard care that patients are getting there. Uh, so that's, that's our goal uh, to make Karbala is into a city of excellence as far as the healthcare is concerned. Most people who are successful know what they want to do in their life and they also have a plan how they're going to achieve it. Uh, but there are some people who stand out. They are more successful than everybody else in their group. And I think these are those people who not only know what they want to do, they also not only know how they're going to do it, but they also know why they want to do it. What motivates them? What, when they wake up, they, they know 
why they want to go to work. So in my case, you know, everybody has his own passion. You know, serving Imam Hussain alayhi salam has been the biggest passion of my life. I have a very special relationship with this personality since I was a little boy. And I really believe that everything I have is God's given me because of him. So really, I, I feel like he's my real boss and I work for him. And this is what, and I put this in my profession. I really think that this is my job, that I have to help people representing him. My name is Steve Toadvine. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the Baptist Health Medical Group, headquartered here in Louisville, Kentucky. My job is really to facilitate everything that's going on in our physician practices across the state of Kentucky and just to ensure that we are providing excellent patient care on a daily basis. I, I've been honored to serve on the board for the Imam al huja Hospital in uh, Karbala, Iraq. I've uh, been involved for a few months now. Initially, I was introduced to the project by my friend, Dr. Kashif Hyder in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. I was incredibly impressed with, with the passion he had for this project and then the passion of the other board members, the physicians who were involved, uh, Mr. Jaffer al Kazwini, who's just a man of great integrity. And, and so my role with, with uh, the board has been an advisory capacity, try to connect them with whatever uh, we can provide from our hospitals here uh, in the states in terms of uh, um, consulting and some recommendations, in my case, particular to uh, uh, the anticipated uh, hopeful Joint Commission International Accreditation, which uh, we hope to achieve someday. The global aspects of this project re really highlight uh, the common need for us as, as people all over the world to be concerned about the welfare of those who, who, who need care, those who are less fortunate, uh, to really bring the same level of expertise and medical care to, to, to anyone who needs it wherever they are. The connection here that's being established between physicians and others here in the United States with those in other parts of the world is going to be mutually beneficial. There's, there's much for us to learn from, from the folks in Iraq and I think that we have something to offer to the, to the folks in Iraq as well. So it really is going to build community, build relationships. And to me personally, it's, it's, it's just fascinating and something that's very, very exciting for me to be involved in. The thought to me that, that I could contribute in some way to, to care for individuals on the other side of the world uh, in, a, in a city who, who needs more care today, the thought that I can be involved in that it, it is gratifying. But it's also really just, it's just part of what it means to be, to, to be a human being, but it's certainly part of what it means to be a physician. Our aim right now for the hospital in Karbala is to offer care that is unparalleled and is as high of a quality as can be found anywhere in the world. That is one reason we're going to pursue Joint Commission accreditation for this facility. We, we don't want to provide substandard care in any way. It is a charity project which means significant resources will need to be deployed to provide care for all who need it. At the same time, we want to provide services in high specialty areas that are not available in the region today. Within the next two years, I would love to see the hospital functioning. I would love to see patients who have come in, received care, gone out thankful for what they've had, ready to, to go on, uh, with better health, better quality of life, and I'd like to see that hospital become an essential part of the community there in Iraq. We, we want to see lives changed through their experience in this hospital. What motivates me on a daily basis is really the thought of, of making a difference in the world, making the world a better place wherever I find that. My job in particular is, is, is based on providing care, access, improving health, for those folks who live here in the state of Kentucky. On top of that, my passion obviously leading me to, 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 to join in this project is that same concern for folks around the world and if there's a way that I can touch those or be involved in, in helping others touch those, that will keep me going. I left Iraq actually uh, to study, to study abroad and get the experience and so on. And I opened my horizon. Then I finished first degree, that was, on, that was in, in Britain. The war started, the Iraqi-Iranian war started, which is, it's, it's 
nonsense. But anyway, it took long. And I really refused to go back and join the army. So my father, God, God bless his heart, he passed away. Uh, he said, continue. The field of the computer just start to be noticed early 80s. And my background actually in two majors, double majors, electrical and electronics. So I thought, hmm, this is a good opportunity to study computer right now. So when I went to the state, I took a lot of courses to be prepared for my master's uh, in computer science. So I finished the master's degree in computer science, as well as I was teaching at uh, Stray University for about five and a half years. Sorry, I didn't mention that. As an adjunct professor in computer, I was teaching database uh, uh, and data warehousing courses. One, uh, one undergraduate and two, I believe, graduate courses, level 200 or 300. After the capture of Saddam, I thought I could go back and uh, help, help my family as well as help my fellow uh, Iraqi. You know, living in the state is wonderful, you know. You could have uh, best accommodation, you could have the best job, and so on. And thank God, I did very well. And, you know, even I have, I have a daughter and, and a son. My daughter, Hiba, just graduated a year and a half ago with her master's degree in IT. And my son, Ali, graduated last May, also an IT major. So we are an IT company. The reason, you ask a good question, the reason why I joined the hospital and I left my work and I left it to my brothers and cousins and so on to run it, is I thought I could contribute here. I could help. Help, it's not just in cutting costs, not really. Help young people, to, you know, I could teach young people. I could give them the, the, what I learned as well as establishing something unique that, you know, I've been doing so many times back in, in, in the state, and we don't have it here. This is kind of uh, maybe the first hospital with the, such a network, or maybe one or two across the, the whole Iraq. We don't have this technology in hospital. What I wish really from the bottom of my heart, I wish one thing. I want to make this hospital, not just me, with the rest of the people with me, to be a unique hospital in Iraq. So all of us will be proud of it, that we lived outside and we brought the technology, what we have, and we could build something, we could establish something for the people, for the sake of the needy, for the sake of the poor people, with the latest technology, latest medicine, and so on and so on. This is not being done. And I'm sorry to say it, you know, and I hope one of the officials could hear me. It should be done. We could help people. It's not the money. We could, we could have a less than this. We could establish smaller network and so on. But it's, it's something unique. And what I dream, this hospital to be very successful in a short time. And we will do it. My mother told me, tells me a, a beautiful story. She says, one day I was sitting in the holy shrine of Imam Hussein, and your dad was giving speech and he broke the news to the masses there. So I said, this man, what, what, are you, what, what he's talking about? He doesn't have a house. He does not own a house here and he wants to build a hospital. So she said when he finished, we went into the car together going home. I turned to him, I said to him, why do you give such promises? You don't, you don't own a house in this city. How can you build a hospital? He said to me, I made a pledge with Imam Hussein, and it's, it is going to happen. So it started with a vision and with a vow, and he pursued this vow right to the end. And here you are, you have this hospital, which would be at the inauguration 
inshallah, one of the biggest hospitals in the nation. Karbala is not an ordinary city. Karbala is the hub of the hearts and the minds of all Muslims worldwide. And it is not a city that belongs only to its own 1.2 million citizens. It's a city that belongs, it has a major place in the heart of all Muslims and some non-Muslims too. So uh, many of the physicians, doctors, uh, medical staff, they aspire, they dream of going to such a city and serving not only the citizens of that city, but millions of people who come every year to pay tribute to the shrine of Imam Hussein. So the best doctors, the best surgeons are waiting for this project to begin so they can get on board and they can go there and serve because they are not serving a building, neither they are uh, serving a group of people, they are serving Islam through serving the city of Imam Hussein Karbala. Imam Hussein gave his entire life for God and for the, for the humanity to protect the people. And therefore we must give, we must give at least part of our time, part of our wealth, part of our expertise back to him because he left nothing. He gave his entire being, his entire family, and therefore people uh, would love to pay him back. So when they give their time and their money, it's nothing compared to the major contribution and major givings of Imam Hussein alayhi Behind me, three kilometers away, is the holy shrines of Imam Hussein and Abu Fadl al-Abbas um, This feeling is very special. For 30 some years living in exile, always we were dreaming of one day that would be very that we come and be very close to the to the shrines of Imam Hussein. And here here we are. We are at a distance less than three kilometers away from the burial site of Abi Abdullah and Hussein. It gives a tremendous uh, special feeling. Um, now, when you have a project like this, this hospital here, um, at, 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 this, at this place, at this site, you will always seek the, the assistance, you seek the blessings of the Imam to be bestowed on the hospital, on its personnel, on, on the patients themselves so they will be fully recovered and treated well going back to their homes. I will be very proud to be one of the very, very humble servants of the cause of Imam Hussein. Um, in, the, in the narrations by the Imams, if someone can help, uh, you know, um, the cause of Imam, Hussein, Imam Hussein with a single brick, just put a one brick on top of other break to help the cause of Imam Hussein, he will get you know ample rewards. Uh, so um, I am happy, elated, and proud to be in the same line. But at the same time, I am ashamed ashamed of Imam Hussein. If tomorrow I meet my Lord and Imam Hussein, the spirit of Imam Hussein, and then he tells me, "What have you done?" Um, honestly, uh, despite the fact that I can say something, still there are so many things that I could and will be able to do and still have failed to do um, because we as a humans have big potentials especially the followers of Ahlul Bayt they have big potentials so no matter how much we serve them still there is room for advancement so there is room for perfection so I would say that um, uh, inshallah at one point I can say little about what we have done in this project something that hopefully can save the innocent lives of the inhabitants of the neighbors of Imam Hussein you see every person who's involved with Imam Hussein has certain value the visitors of Imam Hussein have value the family of Imam Hussein have value the progeny and the grandchildren of Imam Hussein have value as well as the neighbors the inhabitants of this city the residents of the city are also considered to be, you know, neighbors of Imam Hussein and they gain certain values. So in the hereafter, I can say that 
we have helped, you know, no matter how minute is this help and as small as this help, is at least little help toward, you know, saving some innocent life in this city.